stage to this very passionate and energetic woman. She's CEO of Solar Power Europe. Please give her a very loud applause while Borga Hemmetsberger. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Karen. And uh, thanks a lot for the moderation over these two, two days. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the Solar Power Summit. We've been coming to an end. <laughs> But, but not with a proper closing. And I am extremely grateful that we are able to welcome someone who is holding the pen at the moment for solar and for many other things for the closing. We have the great pleasure of having the Belgian minister, Tine van der Straten, who is closing our Solar Power Summit. And Tina is not just holding the pen as an energy minister of Belgium at the moment, but you have to coordinate 27, uh, 26 other uh, energy ministers in the council because you're holding the presidency of the council. When we met at COP28 in Dubai, you and your team have been telling me that you want to put solar more in the spotlight during your Belgian presidency. Um, and you have been doing that. So yesterday we were invited, and thanks very much for that invitation once again, to the Energy Council during lunch. We were able during two hours to discuss solar with all the 27 ministers, which was a great opportunity. We not just discussed how we can take solar forward, how we can lift off uh, in order to get it to the next level, the solar market, but also how we can make sure that we can reshore manufacturing to Europe and really get it to the 30 gigawatt market that we want to see in Europe. These two equally important goals were very much central to the discussions. But what is more important is that you also said it's not a one-off so we want to have a continuous dialogue as of now because solar is so important uh, and that we are also, and I'm very grateful for that, uh, that we're also looking into having a pledge with ministers, with the industry, with the European Commission at the next council, uh, which will be happening in May already. It's a really great pleasure having you for the closing because you know it's really looking towards the future. And I would just ask you to take the floor. Thanks very much for joining us, Tine. Thank you. In terms of raising the bar, uh, well, Birja <laughs> knows how to do it. Huh? Dear ladies and gentlemen, and specifically uh, dear well, Birja, nothing can stop the energy transition. And these are not my words. They were spoken by John Kerry, the US Special Envoy for Climate, only three weeks ago when we were together at the IEA's ministerial meeting uh, at Paris. And indeed, the facts, they speak for themselves. Last year, the newly installed renewable electricity generation capacity worldwide increased by 48% compared to 2022. We must admit, however, that the past two years have been the most turbulent and unpredictable in the history of Europe's energy system. The energy crisis has been added to the climate crisis. On the 24th of February 2022, and this is two years ago already, at 5.30 a.m. Moscow time, state television channels began broadcasting a new address by Vladimir Putin. In that speech, he announced a special military intervention, and that is Russian for full-scale invasion. Within minutes of this announcement, explosions were reported in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Odessa and the Donbass. At about 5 a.m. Kiev time, the Russian aerospace forces and Russian Navy launched missile and bomb attacks on Ukraine military facilities. And simultaneously, the Russian ground forces entered the territory of Ukraine from several directions, including from the occupied Crimea and from the territory of Belarus. It was the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's a moment we all remember. At that time, Europe relied on Russian gas by 40%, with huge differences between countries. Belgium was at 4%, Germany at 50%, and Finland at 94%. It wasn't just gas. Europe also imported large amounts of crude oil, of coal, of uranium from Russia as well. 
And back then, only two years ago, we had no full idea of the scale of the Russian unprovoked and unjustified invasion, of its atrocities, of its devastating global impact on the energy system. It would later turn out that the invasion marked the beginning of the largest energy crisis Europe had ever experienced. And today, we witness winds of change in Europe, not in the least fueled by sun. All over Europe, citizens, companies, and governments work together to wean off Russian fossil fuels. And by reducing consumption and accelerating the energy transition by working together with a common goal. And 2023 was a record year for renewable energy in Belgium, but also worldwide. The IES World uh, Energy Outlook 2023 posits renewable energy sources as strong pillars of optimism. The study reveals that despite the inherent fragility in the energy sector, there exist robust solutions. It shines a light on a glimmer of hope, a clean energy-led new economy. And 2023 was also a record for photovoltaic installations in Europe. For the third consecutive year, the market grew by 30% or more, that's thanks to you. Installed photovoltaic capacity in Europe now stands at 263 gigawatts with Germany, Spain and Italy leading the European trio. Europe and European citizens are taking back control, taking back control of our energy. Ladies and gentlemen, the teams you addressed here today were all framed around missions. I don't know if this has anything to do with uh, Mazzucato, the mission-led economy, or the moonshot theory, okay. <laughs> Several inspirations, uh, mission permitting, mission flexibility, mission innovation, recycling, renewal. Maybe we could say uh, mission solar completed. No, indeed, it's not a given, it's not a given. Um, as you know, and, and while Burga mentioned it, we are in the middle of an exciting period for Belgium because we hold the presidency of the Council uh, to the European Union. And yesterday, indeed, we uh, hosted its first formal Energy Council and we had uh, Walburga uh, over for lunch. Um, and don't think lunch is a lunch. Huh? A lunch is uh, indeed uh, ministers and we are 27 plus the President plus European Commission. Most importantly, this was uh, ministers only. I don't know if you noticed. It was ministers only, so we didn't have any uh, listening room. We didn't have any other uh, people uh, listening in, uh, in the room or outside the room, what we were discussing. That also means uh, that we have a sincere and an open discussion. And it was. She says, yes, it was. Um, and it was, first of all, it was very good uh, to have uh, Solar Power Europe represented by, by Walburga in, in the room. Um, it was uh, good to hear uh, from the sector. It was also good to have the commission and also good uh, to have the ministers and that the three of us were sitting together. Both council, ministers, both European Commission, but the sector as well. And that was one of the main outcomes uh, also uh, from the discussion that we should continue this format, that we should um, listen uh, to each other and better understand each other, but then uh, we can work uh, on, uh, on solutions. And Valdirga did a very good job. She did a very good job at the one, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tell you why. On the one hand, you made, well, Burga, but you as Solar Europe, you made very clear you are ready to do this, that the challenge is high, but that you really believe in what you are doing, and that solar power is really necessary if we want to win off Russian fossil fuels. The solar strategy alone. Uh, in Repower EU can save us 9 BCM of Russian gas, 9 BCM of gas in general. And so that was a very optimistic view that you brought. You, she didn't came complaining. She said, we are here. We are ready to work with you. But she also said, we have issues. We have problems. We have challenges that we want to overcome. And we were also very happy that before we had lunch, we had input from the European Commission, both commissioners from energy, but also from the internal uh, market, uh, Commissioner Simpson and Commissioner Breton, wrote us a letter with things they could do. And that was basically the discussion um, we had. Um, and indeed, um, as well, Burga said, um, presidency and commission, we are together committed to bring our discussion further forward and to see if we can work together on uh, solutions, on maybe 
auction design on maybe organizing resilience and, uh, and so on. So it was a good and a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion. It was shared among all 26 member states, the president and CEO is an honest broker, it was shared by all energy ministers that solar contributes to the solution from sunny Spain to cloudy Ireland and the northern position of Estonia. I quote ministers uh, on that specific topics. But if you are in Hungary, in Poland, maybe those member states that we know least, or Portugal and Spain, maybe we know them better. All of them, all of them count on solar to reach their renewable energy targets. And it comes with challenges also for those member states. Imagine Hungary, I visited Hungary. They want to install more PV capacity than they need at the peak. Imagine what that is as a challenge if you are a Hungarian minister for energy, how to manage flexibility at that point, how to keep your system in balance. Or my colleague, George from Cyprus, he has the most difficulties in fall, in autumn, because he still has heavy fuel installations. And his main worry is clouds, sudden clouds in fall. And then he has to curtail solar because he cannot manage flexibility of heavy, uh, heavy oil uh, facilities. So we all have, as ministers, different uh, uh, challenges that lay in the energy uh, system. And then we have uh, you also as a sector uh, that can also bring forward uh, solutions uh, to those uh, topics. So if we listen to each other and we, if we use this uh, format and continue this industry-led conversation, then I think indeed uh, we can, uh, upcoming uh, councils, informal council that is uh, grid uh, oriented but next formal council on the 30th uh, of may uh, indeed i hope come forward with some sort of uh, pledge or some uh, sort of uh, declaration solar pv has been pivotal in navigating the crisis prompting substantial growth and heightened awareness of energy uh, control and member states have boosted projected capacity by 2030 but we fall short of our climate targets. Also something that you mentioned yesterday. Urgency to reduce reliance on Russian fossil fuels emphasizes the need for further solar expansions. And so we need to accelerate this solar uh, deployment and we can do so if we collaborate uh, even further together. Ladies and gentlemen, the energy transition, the clean energy transition was once born out of climate necessity but it has now become an economic and a security imperative. A better connected Europe is therefore crucial for our continent. And despite the turbulent times that we have faced in recent years, the future is filled with promise. Solar energy serves as a beacon of hope, enhancing the competitiveness of our economies, fortifying our geopolitical security and nurturing the well-being of our citizens. The optimism is palpable, especially in the context of EU support for solar panel installations in Ukraine, backed by Belgium for, by a substantial sum. And with this initiative, 26 Ukrainian hospitals have been equipped with photovoltaic panels. Solar has given a future back to people in Ukraine. And Solar Power Europe has also, also taken proactive steps to send solar panels to Ukraine, a move that not only fortifies the country's energy security, but also towards potential Russian attacks on its power grid. And closer to home, we witness a groundswell of action as well, with countless prosumers and energy communities that band together to embrace solar power. Here in Brussels, we have in uh, St. Gilles, St. Gilles, St. Gilles, where we have solar panels on social housing combined with energy ambassadors. <laughs> Do you know them? <laughs> Did you meet them? No, you should. Uh, but I know some uh, team members who know them. <laughs> you met them? You know these ladies. You know what they tell you? That they clean the house when the sun is shining. I said, that's why my house is never clean, because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, it's crucial to recognize that amid these challenging times, renewable energy and an interconnected Europe, they offer us rays of hope and the dream of a brighter future, a mission we will accomplish together. And no, this message won't self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> Thank you.
So, we are lifting off one last time. Are we ready? Three, Woo. two, one, and go! Thanks very much, Minister van der Straten, joining us. Thanks very much for your ins uh, inspiring speech. We're very happy to count on your further support. We are standing ready to you know, really put all our efforts into cooperating with you to make that happen. Thanks a lot for your support. Thank you, Alvirja. Thank you. So, I think I need to close, no, Karen? Yeah, but we have one last thing to do. Yeah? Yeah, because we're gonna, I would like to thank you and also your team. So I would like to invite the entire Solar Power Europe team here on stage for a photo and get them, give them some applause. And it's so not please. just for the picture. You know, we have an amazing, an amazing Solar Power Europe team who has done a fantastic job, not just putting all of that together, but throughout the whole year. So please, yeah. a big applause for the big team. Big applause, exactly. <laughs> while, while the team is still getting on stage for the picture, I also want to thank all of you joining us again this year for the Solar Power Summit. It was a great pleasure seeing so many of you joining us again, engaging in the debate. I truly hope we'll see each other again next year. Uh, the latest, because I do hope that we have many other opportunities also throughout the year of getting together, engaging and discussing the next steps that solar needs to take. Thanks very much well for being here and uh, thanks for, uh, have a safe travel home. Woo!